I want to show you a, a painting uh, by uh, the famous artist Andy Warhol. I, I'm not good at art. Like, I can't, I can't draw at all. And it, it's actually kind of funny because my boys, they'll ask me to uh, draw pictures for them. And then they'll put my pictures on the refrigerator. And I'm like, I think we kind of got it reversed here. Like, you're supposed to draw stick figures, and I put them on the fridge. You're not supposed to put my stick figures on the fridge. Uh, but I like, to learn, I like to learn about art. And this uh, painting in particular, I'm, I'm not like a huge fan of Andy Warhol. Some of his art makes me feel uncomfortable. But um, this one's actually kind of interesting. If you look at it, you'll notice that he took uh, Leonardo da Vinci's famous, uh, beautiful work of art, uh, the Last Supper, and he made it worse. Uh, so he kind of it drew over it, and, and look at the little, it's like the Cracker Jack, uh, Cracker Box image on the side there. Uh, some people would say it's a reference to the, maybe uh, communion or crackers, and there's also money on there, uh, which maybe is a reference to Judas betraying Jesus for money. And then you have Dove Soap, uh, which is like a reference to the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit cleans us up, but it's, it's a brand, and then General Electric, uh, power or light. He's using this kind of religious imagery and then putting brands on top of it. And a lot of people thought, oh, maybe this is kind of almost a profane image. He's making fun of Christianity. But after Andy Warhol died, uh, people began to reassess his faith. He actually uh, went to Mass uh, multiple times every week. Uh, he was sort of a secret Catholic. And they began to look at paintings like these, uh, The Last Supper Dove. This is called The Last Supper Dove from 1986. And they said, maybe he's actually not commenting on Christianity in general, but he's commenting on what we can make of Christianity. And whenever I sit back and I, I, look, at this, I look at this painting, uh, it makes me feel a certain way. And that's what art does, right? It makes you feel a certain way. Uh, when I look at it, something just feels off, right? And it, it reminds us of how there are times in life when we can take Christianity, we can take our ideas of God, and we can add consumerism and materialism to them. And, and maybe uh, you sit back and you look at this painting, or maybe you look at your own life. If you were to stand back and look at your life as if it were a painting, your face, your faith as if it were a painting, I might make you feel a little strange. Have we taken God and essentially used him as a vehicle uh, to get what we want? to make our lives happier? Have we used Christianity as this vehicle for consumerism, uh, for materialism? And if you were to look at your life today, would it feel a little odd? Does it feel like there's something off about your faith? Uh, in the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, there's a character, and she asks about Aslan, the lion. And now, if you don't know this, Aslan stands for Jesus, okay? He's a Jesus lion. And this character says, hey, is Aslan safe? Is he a safe lion? And the other character, an otter, I know it sounds confusing. You've got the Jesus lion and the otter. And the otter says, of course he's not safe, but he's good. He's good. Have we made God safe? And as a result... We've moved away from his power when we should have been getting closer. Uh, today, we're continuing the series you've been working through here on the names of God. And the name that we're looking at today specifically is the term Yahweh or Jehovah Sid Canoe. Yahweh or Jehovah Sid Canoe. You might have heard it both ways. Essentially, some people disagree on how you would translate that word God, or how you would pronounce it. So is it Yahweh? Is it Jehovah? It's essentially the same thing. Yahweh Sid Canoe, it means the Lord is our righteousness. Righteousness. That's kind of a funny word, isn't it? We talk about righteousness, and maybe you've used that term in the past. But what is righteousness? What does God being righteous actually mean? Essentially, it's this. The righteousness of God means God does what is right, not because he's obligated to, but because he defines what is right. So I'll say it a different way. God is good and only does what is good. And sometimes that goodness takes unexpected turns. 
And sometimes we can take that goodness, we can take the righteousness of God, and we can use it as a vehicle for ourselves. I know that happens in my life. I know that there have been times I have to be careful, right? Because you start describing God, and how does God sound? He starts to sound kind of like yourself, right? The decisions you make or your perspective or philosophy on life, uh, that's what God becomes. And maybe you've experienced that in your life as well. Uh, when you sit back, you realize that your Christian faith is an opportunity for you to feel good or feel happy or to get what you want rather than reflecting on the awe inspiring nature of God's righteousness. God is good and only does what is good, but sometimes that takes unexpected turns. Yahweh or Jehovah Sid Canoe, the Lord is our righteousness. We're going to learn more about that today, so if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to the book of Jeremiah. So that term... The Lord is our righteousness, it only occurs twice in the Bible. It's a Hebrew term, and most of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And both of those instances occur in the book of Jeremiah. So Jeremiah chapter 33, and I need to give you a quick recap on Jeremiah. So uh, Jeremiah, when he was very young, God called him to be a prophet. And to speak to the priests, the leaders... Uh, the people of Judah, the nation of Judah, and to call them to repentance. To say, if you don't repent, then God's judgment will come. He will, he will allow you to experience the consequences of your evil. And he did this for about 40 years. And for 40 years, he was threatened, he was ridiculed, he was beaten, he was thrown in stocks, he was left for dead, and he was kidnapped. And there's this interesting point in the book where he says, God, I have become a laughing stock all the day. The people did not care to listen. Why? Because he didn't bring good news. They had a particular perspective on God and their faith. And what Jeremiah said didn't line up with that image. So Jeremiah chapter 33, uh, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the guard. Thus says the Lord who made the earth, the Lord who formed it to establish it. The Lord is his name. Call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the houses of this city and the houses of the kings of Judah, that were torn down to make a defense against the siege mounds and against the sword. They are coming in to fight against the Chaldeans and to fill them with the dead bodies of men whom I shall strike down in my anger and my wrath. For I have hidden my face from this city because of their evil. Uh, we learn from this passage that Jeremiah, he's actually been thrown into prison. He's been locked away because of his message. And at this point, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, <coughs> they are knocking on Jerusalem's door. They are laying siege to the city. And God says, I've turned my face away from you because of your sin. And if you go through the book of Jeremiah, you find that the people are falling apart. They're supposed to be a lighthouse. The nations of the world were supposed to look at the people, the Hebrew people, and say, wow, I want to know their God. This wasn't happening. Jeremiah talks about how they had forsaken God. They had worshipped idols instead of the Lord. Their leaders have all led them astray. They oppressed the foreigners in their country. They oppressed the orphan, the widow, the needy. They had become greedy. They stole, committed adultery, committed murder, and they even practiced human sacrifice with their children to these idols. God is angry at them. God's wrath has come. And at that moment, the Babylonians were about to destroy the city of Jerusalem. And yet the people of Judah still didn't listen. They say things like, oh, God's not going to judge us. We're his people. They used that label as a way to protect or shield themselves 
from God's judgment. Now, remember that, that term, uh, righteousness, that I mentioned. The Lord is our righteousness. If God is good because he defines what is right, then that means God's judgment is good. God judging Jerusalem is good. The first point that we can learn from this passage is that God takes sin seriously. God takes sin seriously. God's righteousness demands righteousness. You know, in our world today, we really don't want to hear about um, the judgment of God, do we? And perhaps uh, maybe you grew up in an environment uh, where you heard a lot about the judgment of God. Uh, hell, fire, brimstone sermons. We don't like to think of God's wrath. And you might even be thinking, wait, you're a guest speaker. You're, you're supposed to encourage us. You're not supposed to talk about dead bodies. I know it might not seem very 21st century of us, but God's judgment, what we see in this passage, is actually good news. It's good news. Why? Because God takes evil seriously. To understand the righteousness of God, we have to understand that God takes evil seriously. Uh, in his autobiography, uh, Frederick Douglass, the, the former slave and abolitionist, he talks about his grandmother, and he talks about how his, uh, from a young age, his grandmother was owned uh, by a family. And she worked her whole life taking care of this family. And the last member of the family ended up passing away. And she had uh, re helped raise him since he was a young child. And she was actually the last person on earth that he saw. She took care of him on his deathbed. Uh, and rather than being set free, uh, they were all transferred to another family. And at this point in time, uh, Frederick Douglass's grandmother uh, was very old, was very weak. And so this new family decided that they were going to build her a shack in the middle of the woods and leave her there to die. She would die alone, not surrounded by family, not surrounded by friends, after a lifetime of slavery by herself. And he ends the story with this phrase. Will not a righteous God visit for these things? Will not a righteous God visit for these things? Sometimes we, we balk at the idea of, of God's judgment. Maybe we even erase it from our faith. But I think deep down we realize that we wouldn't want to live in a world where a righteous God doesn't take sin seriously. Uh, we look at all the evil in our world, all the pain and suffering, what's happened to us, even what we've done to others. And we wouldn't want to live in a world where a righteous God would not visit for these things. In your own life, have you turned God into sort of this, this neat, safe, mythical figure who doesn't take sin seriously? Uh, maybe you were in uh, this environment when you were younger where uh, they concentrated a lot on God's judgment, so you've gone the opposite direction. Have you created a God in your mind, this, a painting, a God that shows no anger towards sin, who doesn't judge sin? Or perhaps maybe you're like Judah. Judah. And you use that label. Maybe you use your Christian label to say, oh, you know, God's not going to judge me. Or, or God doesn't take the sin in my life seriously. Maybe God only judges those different than you. When we read this passage and when we read about Judah, it, it shocks us. The evil that has permeated their society. We may not worship physical idols like them. But we try to find happiness and purpose outside of God. Uh, what's an idol? Something we look to, a temporary item we look to, to bring us purpose and eternal relief. Oh, we do that all the time, don't we? With our job, with our clothes, with our homes. We may not physically oppress the foreigners, orphans, widows, the needy. But we do, do we do anything to help them? 
or do we insulate ourselves with our own comfort? Uh, no one likes to think that they're greedy. Has anybody ever looked at you and said, I am so greedy, be careful. <laughs> no one. And yet greedy people still exist. We may not commit adultery physically, but we commit adultery in our hearts. We may not practice human sacrifice, but we sacrifice the unborn. We sacrifice our children for our careers, for our salaries, to our own idols. Do you need to be reminded today that God is a righteous God of justice, that God takes sin seriously? Is it possible that you find yourself in a similar situation like the nation of Judah? It's really difficult because uh, it's easy to judge other people but not hold ourselves to the same standards. I had a, I had a friend a couple years ago, and every once in a while we'd go run errands together or go eat lunch together, uh, and he's, he's a salty guy, right? But it's, but it's great because we're supposed to be the salt of the earth. He's kind of a salty guy, and uh, anytime I would go with him, I was always really worried about his driving. So I'd, I'd text my wife, Priscilla. I'd say, hey, like, something happens to me. I love you. Tell my story. Tell my story. And I remember this one day, uh, I'm riding with him, and we're at this stoplight, and there's a car in front of us. And the light turns green, and <laughs> the car in front of us doesn't immediately move, okay? And so my friend, I, he doesn't just do a little, like, little, little love tap on the horn to let him know. I, he starts honking the horn, and he's like, come on, like, are you not paying attention? And I, at that point, I'm like, oh, no, I dropped my phone on the, on the ground, uh, you know. The little old lady didn't go immediately, uh, and he was pretty angry. So we run this errand, and, and we come back, and we're at the stoplight, and we're first in line. And he's just, he's chatted up, he's telling me a story, the light turns green, okay? He doesn't immediately go. Somebody honks behind him, and what's his reaction? He's like, oh, you know what? Ah, sometimes we just don't hold ourselves to our own standards. No, that wasn't his reaction. His, hey, come on, why, why are people being patient these days? What's going on in our world? It's difficult to hold ourselves to the standards we set. And we'll read something like this story, and we'll say, oh, wow, Judah, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? Jerusalem. And yet oftentimes we live the same way. We create this image of faith. We project this righteousness of God, but it usually just looks like ourself and not the God of the Bible. God takes sin seriously, but he also takes restoration seriously. I'm going to pick back up in verse 6. Jeremiah 33, 6, it says, Behold, I will bring to it, Jerusalem, health and healing, and I will heal them and reveal to them abundance of prosperity and security. I will restore the fortunes of Judah and the fortunes of Israel and rebuild them as they were at first. I will cleanse them from all the guilt of their sin against me, and I will forgive all the guilt of their sin and rebellion against me. And this city shall be to me a name of joy, a praise and a glory before all the nations of the earth who shall hear of all the good that I do for them. They shall fear and tremble because of all the good and all the prosperity I provide for it. I'm going to jump down to verse 14. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, The Lord is our righteousness, or Yahweh Jehovah Sid canoe. Notice what's going on here. The Babylonians are laying siege to the city. The city is running out of food. The people are in a desperate situation. 
God is bringing his judgment. He has turned them over to the consequences of their sin. And yet, still in that moment, while his prophet, who had warned them for centuries, is locked away, God is already saying, I will restore you. That this exile, when you'll be taken away to the land of Babylon, will actually become a blessing. Health, restoration, joy, and peace will come. If you look at the, the Hebrew word for health here, it literally means new flesh. This exile will have a healing effect. Joy and praise and glory will come. And all the nations will eventually look and say, wow, something's going on in Jerusalem. We need to learn more about their God. And then it uses that phrase, the Lord is our righteousness. Yahweh or Jehovah Sid Kenu. And it talks about this future king, this leader who would come and would fulfill everything that a good leader was supposed to fulfill, that no one else could. And he would bring peace to the land. Not only would his name be the Lord is our righteousness, but notice how the city will be called the Lord is our righteousness. The king will reign and there will be this cover of righteousness that the people would live under. So notice what's happening here. This ideal king would come and he would cleanse the people. He would take care of sin. God takes sin seriously but he takes restoration seriously. That this exile would be discipline that would turn their hearts back to him. I, I was reading this, this uh, book by a theologian named uh, Christopher Watkin, and he has this really interesting way of looking at um, competing ideas in the Bible that oftentimes seem contradictory. And he uses this big word called diagonalization. Uh, don't dwell too much on that, but I think the concept could be applied here. So we're talking about God's justice, taking sin seriously, but we're also talking about God's love, restoration seriously. And I, I have this, this slide, and, and there, there are two boxes or two ideas. Uh, on the first side, you have God's love, and there are a lot of people who emphasize that. And they'll say, oh, you know, God is a God of love. God, God doesn't judge God forgives. God is completely loving. We don't have to, to worry about punishment because that's not what God is into. And uh, maybe you've fallen into to that camp or may, maybe you've followed some teachers who've fallen into that camp. Uh, and that's one side. And, and then the next box would be God's justice. And we've talked about that. Well, God takes sin seriously. And all sin has to be paid for. And God does not let sin go. And I think what can happen a lot of times is we can be forced into one of these two boxes. But when we read through the Bible and we learn about the righteousness of God, it helps us to cut across both. And Casey's going to put up this next slide. And the Lord is our righteousness connects both at the same time. Both are completely true. So there's this idea that maybe, well, somewhere in the center, but that doesn't really work, right? God's loving sometimes, but sometimes he's a God of justice. No, God is completely loving all of the time. He takes restoration seriously, but he also takes justice seriously. Because you can't have love if you don't have justice. I think about that in the life of your, your children or the people around you. If you were just to see someone uh, getting just pummeled and destroyed, and you didn't take that seriously, would it really be love? God's love and God's justice are completely true at the same time. And that phrase, the Lord is our righteousness, explains how it happens. If you read through that, that prophecy, it, it mentions that, that branch of David, that king that would come that would be uh, of the lineage of David. That king is Jesus. And throughout the gospel story, we see the figure of Jesus. That king that would come that would do what no other king could do. He would take sin seriously, but also take restoration seriously. Notice what happened to Jesus. Jesus was faithful even to the cross. And on the cross, we talk about how he died for our sins. 
And maybe you've asked this question before. I know I've asked this question before. Well, why did Jesus have to die for our sins? Why couldn't God have just let it go? Because God takes sin seriously. And there's a price to pay for sin. But God also takes restoration seriously. So what did Jesus do? Jesus took on our sin and paid the price for that. Here's a good way of thinking about it. God looked at Jesus on the cross and he saw us. He saw my mistakes. He saw your mistakes. He saw all the times that, like Judah, we've wandered astray. God looked at Jesus and he saw us so he could look at us and see Jesus, the great substitute. And we see how the righteousness of God cuts across both. God is fully loving, but he also takes sin seriously. And when Jesus becomes our king, the Lord, our righteousness, becomes the city by which we live under. So we are under that canopy. We are under the righteousness of God. God takes sin seriously, but he also takes restoration seriously. Do we take those seriously today? I was reading a short story by Flannery O'Connor recently. Uh, and I think the best way to describe Flannery O'Connor uh, is to imagine if the film director Quentin Tarantino... Uh, was a Christian woman who wrote fiction in the 1960s. That's probably the best way to describe Flannery O'Connor. And she has this fascinating story called Revelation. And uh, some of Flannery O'Connor's work is just, it's a, little, it's a little tough. Her job, is to, her role, is to really shake us up and to help us understand where we're at in terms of our faith. And that's what this story, Revelation, does. So most of it takes place in a a waiting room, and uh, one of the main characters is a woman named Miss Turpin. And Miss Turpin, uh, she is uh, she's a hypocrite. She talks about her Christian faith, but she acts terribly to the people around her. Uh, she makes fun of those in her mind. She calls them ugly. She calls them white uh, trash. She's racist. She's classist. And she even looks at this uh, young girl named Mary Grace who's reading a book, and she's like, oh, she is just so ugly. And Mrs. Turpin, uh, in the story, it's really strange because she keeps talking about her pigs, and she's like, I've got pigs, and they're the cleanest pigs around. Like, they're so clean. And eventually, uh, she's thinking to herself, and she thinks about, oh, she's like, I'm so thankful that I'm white, and I'm so thankful that I'm not white trash. And verbally, after she says that, she says, oh, thank you, Jesus. Jesus, thank you. And it's at that moment that in the story, Mary Grace takes her big textbook, and she just throws it right at Mrs. Turpin's face. And Mrs. Turpin, she's just, she's bleeding everywhere. And that's when Mary Grace, she looks at her, and she says this. She says, go back to hell where you came from, you old wart hog. And if you're reading the story, you're like, oh, Mary Grace, yes. I won't ruin the rest of the story. But there's something really important, important that Flannery O'Connor's trying to teach us. That we need a revelation to wake us up. Sometimes we can be so ingrained in our version of Christianity and our version of faith that we fail to realize how our worldview is inconsistent with Christ. Mary grace, an act of grace to wake us up. And that's what we see in this passage. This act of grace to wake the people of Judah up. And today as we reflect on that phrase, the Lord is our righteousness, we have to ask ourselves, do we need a revelation today. Today, do you take the justice of God seriously? Do you take sin seriously in your life? As I mentioned before, it's easy when we've grown up in a certain environment to go the opposite direction. Do we take our personal sin seriously? And as a result, do we also take sin seriously in the world? It can be easy when your life is going well and you're feeling pretty comfortable 
to see injustice or to see reports of injustice and to, to ignore them, to act like they don't exist? Do we take evil seriously? Today, do you need to step back and look at your life as if it were a painting and to examine how you've turned the righteousness of God into something it shouldn't be? Do you need to repent today? Do you repent of the sin in your life or to repent of the times that you've ignored injustice around you? There might be others who are here today and when you reflect on the righteousness of God, you need to take restoration seriously. Some of you, you have your own story like Judah where you've lived in direct opposition to the righteousness of God. And you've seen the consequences of your actions. And you've wondered if God would ever love or accept you. And it's important today that we reflect on God's love and on the person of Jesus. And you've been trying so hard to earn God's forgiveness when it's already been earned for you. Do you take sin, evil seriously? Do you take restoration seriously? I love this quote. There's a quote from Timothy Keller, Pastor Timothy Keller. And he says, Christianity isn't about do's and don'ts. It's about allegiance to Jesus. And I love how that works within the metaphor that we're thinking about today. It says this ideal king would set up this city and would have that banner of righteousness that we could live under. Do we live in allegiance to King Jesus? And when we do that, we'll take sin seriously. We'll take evil seriously in our own lives and in the world. And when we commit evil, we'll take repentance seriously because that's the banner of righteousness that we live under. When you live under that banner of righteousness, you also take restoration seriously. You'll accept that for yourself, but you'll also give it away to other people. The Lord is our righteousness. Today, do you need to offer him your repentance, your commitment, or do you simply need to accept the restoration that he's offered you through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? The Lord is our righteousness. Yahweh, Jehovah, Sid, Canoe.